This is the Wealthy Wednesday Radio Show with your host, Lucy McMonagle, a money manifester, coach, and public speaker who's on a mission to helping you create more wealth in your life and business. This show will inspire and empower you with various topics and has expert guests. Let's welcome your host, Lucy McMonagle. Welcome to the Wealthy Wednesday Radio Show. This is your host, Lucy McMonagle, and I am so grateful that you're here today. And I would like to thank you for showing up. Today we have an incredible guest, and I'm really, really excited that he actually took time out of his incredibly busy schedule so that he could be on the Wealthy Wednesday Radio Show. His name is Evan Zislist. And he is an organizational solutions and strategist consultant based out of Aspen, Colorado. Evan helps people to simplify so they can focus on what matters most in their life, which is who we love, what we do, how and why we live, because everything else is just stuff. His professional practice is dedicated to helping people in five ways, organization, operational systems, time and task management, content creation, and professional networking. He works with households, businesses, teachers, and students, and people in life transitions. Let's get a warm welcome for Evan. Welcome to the show, Evan. Good afternoon. How are you, Lucy? I am doing fantastic, and I am so grateful you're here on the show today. And I wanted to make sure that everybody is aware that you are also an incredible author of the book called Clutter Free Revolution. Yes, I'm very excited. It launched as an ebook back in April, and it's just about ready to go to print. Um, it should be out in print on Amazon before the end of the month. Oh, that's so fabulous. That's so fabulous. And uh, what is the website that you would like to have our audience go to if they wanted to contact you or if they wanted to find out more information about your book? For the book, it's clutterfreerevolution.com. Okay, and that's spelled C-L-U-T-T-E-R. Free F R E E Revolution R E V O L U T I O N dot com. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Fabulous. So make sure you go to Clutter Free Revolutions to find out more information about his book. So lately, we've been hearing a lot about the minimalist movement, tiny homes, do it yourself home improvements, how to paring down and getting organized. And that's been a really, really hot topic among the the new bestsellers, including uh, Marie Kondo and Joshua Becker and Peter Welsh. Now, among them is also you, Evan, as an organization and strategist consultant based out of Aspen. Can you tell us why is this such a hot topic and who did you write your book for? Sure. Well, I think that a lot of people are experiencing this phenomenon that I call the too much. And um, it, it's basically where people are feeling a little bit saturated in their thing. And they've gotten kind of caught up in this culture of accumulation. And it, it just feels like it's too much and people want to shed some of that excess. And so this book is really designed, it, it's written for typical American families. Um, most specifically the mommies of household. So uh, the people who are going to resonate with this book the most are usually uh, uh, educated mommies, working women. Uh, They usually have one or two or three or four or five children, um, and their job is really just to sort of manage the household as best as they're able to do. And it turns into a lot of cleaning up and tidying up and time management, and when can I finally get around to creating the spaces that I want to occupy as the the head of this household, um, and and getting to the things that I want to do as head of this household, Um, and not just always being in this position of cleaning up after everybody else and feeling like I'm spinning my wheels and putting off my dreams and goals. So 
this book is really designed to empower the head of the household in order for her to realize her dreams um, and her vision of what she wanted her life to be like when she was in her formidable years. So um, that's that's kind of who it's for. And and what we're what we're seeing is that this is a um, not just a national trend, but a global trend. Um, so it's, it, this is the this has really become <laughs> a hot topic because um, people are really kind of feeling this pain. That is so true, and, and a lot of people, they, they're feeling the pain of, of the commercialization and, you know, always looking for that next item, that next piece that's going to get them more happiness. And, and the more and more that we accumulate stuff, the less and less happy we seem to be. And um, I believe you've touched upon um, quite a bit of different areas of that. Now, the full title of your book is Clutter-Free Revolution, Simplify Your Stuff, Organize Your Life, and Save the World. Now, why, with so many different things about organizing already out there, what is the difference about your particular book and how can it help individuals? So what's different about this book is that it's not just about how to organize your stuff. It does that. Um, I have a very simple three-step method um, that we'll probably talk about a little bit later. Um, but what this book does more specifically is it helps people to put into context what their impact is on a global scale. This is not just about tidying up. It's about what is our responsibility as members of the human race, as consumers on this planet. And that is what is the, the biggest difference of this book. It's not just about what you do in your space. It's about what you do matters and it starts at home. So that's where the viral exponential effect of this book comes into play. That's why it's not just tidy up your stuff. That's, the, that's why, the, you know, this book is not titled um, How to Clean Up Your Space. This book is really about empowering people with a new lens about what sort of an impact they are having on the world and how they can not only tidy up their space, but shift their paradigm and look through um, life through a different lens that really does start to shape a movement of people um, really uh, committed to the, what I call the global solution. So um, that, that's, what's, that's the primary difference between this book and other books that show you how to organize. Okay. Wow, that's really interesting. And, and really shifting your perception so that you have a new pair of lenses on and, and creating this as a global impact and a global solution. Can you give a little more in depth about what do you mean by the global solution? Sure. Um, so we hear a lot about um, what is green. And when something is green, it means that it's good for the environment or it's good for the planet or there's some measure of sustainability built into that uh, whatever it is that we're buying whether it's got fewer chemicals, it's less toxic, um, it was, it was um, more efficiently manufactured, or there's some component of um, uh, uh, a living wage was paid to the people that, that helped to manufacture this item, or at least people were uh, not forced through uh, slave, slave labor conditions to manufacture something. So there's, there's this new understanding, it's not that new, it's, it's several decades old, and Patagonia um, Inc. is one of the, the founders of this movement, which is really designed to how do you create products and services in a way so that they are not doing any harm um, or minimizing harm, not only to individuals affected by the production and manufacturing process, but also in the chemicals that are used and um, the processes that are used and the materials used um, in such a way that, um, that we're not 
in our consumption that we are not doing harm to the planet and other people and habitats and so on and so forth. So anything that, when I talk about the global solution, we're really talking about um, making a concerted effort not only to minimize what we need so that we're not just voraciously consuming things all the time, um, but also trying to have some awareness of what are the impacts of the things that we consume beyond the stores that we purchase them from. So were there, you know, 11 and 12 year old um, children in, you know, Southeast Asia responsible for manufacturing these items at a slave wage, at a slave wage? Um, or were, was there a living wage associated with the, the production of this, of this product? Um, you know, when we talk about um, the cotton industry as one of the biggest industries where pesticides and herbicides, really harmful chemicals, are used in the manufacturing and production of these, of these products. And so is there an opportunity to, to use an alternative material like organic um, cotton or hemp? Well, not everybody can afford that, but it's really just about having an awareness of what goes into the production process and starting to shift what you consume to second hand, things that are available to you, um, multi-use, so that it's uh, not just everything that, that I buy is new at the store and had to go through this manufacturing process. If there's still life in something, giving it an opportunity to be used until it's threadbare. Um, and, and that's not appropriate for everything, certainly. But what it, when I talk about the global solution, it's really helping people to have an awareness of what went into um, their consumption and what are the impacts beyond their own homes of that consumption. Wow, wow, now that takes it into a whole new level on understanding, you know, the impact of, you know, the items that we're actually purchasing and, you know, how are those items made and, and were the people treated fairly for making those items and, you know, a lot of people, they're, they might decide, well, wearing cotton is really, really healthy for me, but then if, if we really look into it and if it's cotton that's been create chemically create chemically treated with pesticides and herbicides and other things that could actually be causing you know a skin condition that you're not even aware of so mentioning the the organic not just the skin, hmm? not just the skin not just the skin condition for you hmm. but usually the, those those harmful chemicals are impacting the people where those items are being manufactured. So if, if harsh chemicals, pesticides and herbicides, are used in the production of the cotton as it's being grown, mm -hmm. it's those environments that are the most impacted. So coffee is an excellent example. There's so many harmful chemicals that are, that are used in the production of coffee um, that it really does tremendous long-term damage to the habitat and environment of the farms that are growing that coffee, and that is having a negative impact on the farmers and their families in those communities where that, that coffee is being grown. So, I mean, it's, it's not just about this cotton was grown in an inorganic fashion using harsh chemicals, and I might have a reaction from it. It's the people on the other side of the planet, um, and those environments, and those habitats affecting other animals. Um, that are that are feeling the biggest uh, effect, whether it's fossil fuels that go into a certain uh, 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 the production of certain things. What we're really trying to um, help people to understand is if they have a smaller we always hear about carbon footprint, mm -hmm. but if people just have a, a smaller consumption footprint, if people just need less, that's what this book is about. It's about less stuff and more life, giving more value to things that are not just tangible physical objects that you buy at the store, but really giving more meaning and more value to your experiences and the relationships of the people in your life. So that's what this book, that's why this is a save the world kind of a book. It's because um, 
we're really trying to, to help people have an awareness of more stuff is just more stuff. It's not a better life, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely, Evan. That makes that's, perfect sense. That's not, that's not what we're told in the commercials on television. What we're told on commercials on television is more stuff equals a better life, and it's a lie. It's a lie. And we talk about the lie in the book. Um, that, that, that lie is being propagated by very smart, very savvy con artists that are trying to get us to give, the, give them our money. But they're trying to sell happiness, and it's, it's, not, it's not true, which is why people develop compulsive shopping behaviors, because the, the lie is, is, is just a lie. There is no happiness at the end of the, the endless pit of consumption. They, they do try to make it happiness in a bottle or happiness in a purse or happiness in a pair of jewelries or, or you know, happiness wearing these jeans. And they, you know, commercial marketers do attempt to make a lot of people to look like if you just get this, your life will be easier. If you just buy this and, you know, but you get so many confused because you have like a hundred different products that you could use just to mop your floor with or you have a hundred different choices to buy a purse and it gets overwhelming and you know while you're overwhelming and obsessing about oh should I buy this purse or that purse or should I buy this or that will this make me feel better they're missing the entire point which is your point is finding more meaning and more value with the people that are in their lives so I am assuming, Evan, that you're talking about forming better relationships with the people that are around you so that you are more supported and supporting of one another, and plus you're getting really quality time to spend with other people. Absolutely. Um, I, I think part of the things that I talk about in the book is that um, be, what makes us remarkably human is our ability to have um, really powerfully um, important and meaningful experiences that help to shape who we are in the world and why we are in the world. Part of what makes us human is that we have the ability to connect with others, whether it's um, other people in our, in our immediate lives, the uh, people in our families, our, our communities, so our experiences and our relationships have taken a back seat to being human consumers. We've forgotten how to be human beings. We've stopped being and we've stopped valuing the being. And what we, what we have put more of an emphasis and where we put, we exhaust our resources, be they time resources and financial resources, into consuming things that aren't necessarily improving our lives. I mean, some, some things absolutely do improve our lives. Mm -hmm. But so much of our culture, especially in the United States, is around consumption and shopping that we have misallocated our precious resources on things like, well, you know, just being at the mall. The mall culture in this country is is very unique to other places in the world. So we've, what I want to try to, what I would like to encourage people to do is put more of their time, energy, and resources into really powerful and meaningful experiences and really connecting with the individuals in their lives um, in a way that helps to improve um, you know, those relationships rather than fixating and focusing so much on what is commercialized and what is for sale. So soda is a perfect example. There's a thousand different brands of soda. You were saying that it's confusing because there's a hundred different options. Yes. All 100 of those options are bad for us. All 100 of them. Soda is a terrible product that is causing, it's wreaking havoc on, on the American population in particular. It's not good for us physiologically. It's not good for us mentally because it, it really screws up our brains and our ability to think. Mm -hmm. So, but, but what the message is on television in particular is that this 
this particular brand of soda will make you happy. It says it right on the on the um, tractor trails. If you look at Coca-Cola, it's something like, you know, uh, happiness in a can or something like that. I mean, if, if you look at these, if, if, you, if you look at these commercials, these are commercials that are selling happiness with a product that is not good for you at all. <laughs> at all. I completely understand that, Evan, and um, yeah. I, I personally do not drink soda. I haven't drank soda in quite a few years, actually. I don't remember how many years it's been. And, and that is an example on how a lot of the products can be marketed that are, are truly not healthy for your body or your body chemistry. And that's important to understand that when, when you are looking at the, the products that you're going to consume, look at the labels. What are the ingredients? Find out what's in it. Find out what those ingredients mean so you can make an informed, healthy decision. Well, that's not just true for the, the food we consume, and I absolutely agree. That's perfect. Um, I like things to be as organic as they can be, as locally produced as they can be. Um, but, of course, that's not possible for everybody. But um, more and more places are offering um, local and free-range um, you know, meats and eggs and milk and um, produce and those kinds of farmers markets are on the rise in this country, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also true, what you just described is also true for other things that we purchase, like Barbie dolls. What, not only what went into the manufacturing of a Barbie doll, but what is the message of a Barbie doll to its recipient? How are, um, how are the things that are out there and for sale impacting our view of ourselves, for example? We have this. Um, this body image complex in this country that is so skewed by some of the things that are just pushed on us um, that we body image is a, is a huge issue in this country largely because of what we are told is pretty um, and what is attractive and so it's not just about the food we eat those ingredients that you just were describing about food are across the board. Are we scrutinizing the things that we're buying and thinking about, why do I need this? What is this going to do for me? And, and how I help people, because I help people declutter in their spaces and get organized in their spaces. And one of the, one of the ways that um, I help people to decide what to keep and what not to keep is, is this object, is this thing going to help me do what I want to do and be the person that I want to be before I die. And if it doesn't, it's, it's a liability. It's superfluous. It's just excess. It's just too much. So really helping people to sift through the, the, um, the piles and mounds and oceans of stuff and eliminate the things that, they just, that, that don't serve who they want to be and what they want to do. Wow. And that takes, that takes living in the moment a lot to another level and really being purposeful when you're purchasing items and being purposeful when you're decluttering items out of your house or out of your office or car or any other area that you're using. Yes. Yes, and that, and that has, a, you know, your show is about wealth and um, that has a big impact on your bottom line at home. If people were more, my, my business, my professional practice is, is called Intentional Solutions. If people brought a little bit of mindfulness, a little bit of purposefulness and intention to how they spend their money, what sorts of things am I spending my precious money on? Because people work hard for that dollar. Mm -hmm. How am I spending, um, I talk about the, um, the, the dollar per caloric intake. So how am I spending my preciously earned money on food all of the food that I spend my dollar on better serve me. It better not be harming me because what is the point of that? I worked hard for that money. This food better be serving who I want to be and what I want to do. The, the, the things that I buy at the mall better be serving who I want to be and what I want to do. So just bringing a little bit of awareness and intention to the act of being a consumer on this planet will help people 
to be more intentional with their resources, and I mean their financial resources in addition to other things. So you can increase, it's called the latte factor, you can increase your household budget, how much is available to you to spend on things like vacations or tuition or putting gas in your car or putting uh, uh, you know, money towards your tuition or uh, you know, buying a book bag or a pair of shoes for your kid for the first day of school. You can have more of a budget for those kinds of necessities when you really scrutinize where you put your dollar how you spend your money. I call that strategic savings and intentional spending. That's so, a good one. Definitely, Evan. Strategic s saving and... Would you repeat that again? Sure. So, strategic savings... Okay. Intentional spending. No, sorry. I, I got it backwards. Intentional spending... No, I see? I said it wrong again. Intentional savings, strategic spending. Intentional savings and strategic spending. Now that so that means you're saving your you're saving your money intentionally, and you're spending it strategically. Wow, wow! If, if rather than just because a lot of people save their money and then it burns a hole in their pocket and they just go spend it. That's they're not true. thinking about what they're spending it on. That's true. That's so very true. And just taking that one tip alone will will change change many people's lives right there. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about your clutter free revolution. And you have some very early praise from uh, Dr. Green, the psychologist from the host of the hit TV series Hoarders, and he specifies Evans. Evan shows us how the power of intentional simplicity can transform ourselves and help change the world. Th that is a really, really powerful to receive that. And he also, you also have other other people writing about the book, stating that you. Evans inspires a new generation of conscious consumers, a must-read for every household in America. Could you explain a little bit about conscious consumerism? Yeah, so we've been talking about that. It's, uh, conscious consumer is really just bringing some consciousness to what you, how you spend your money. Um, and I, I referenced Patagonia earlier. You know, mm -hmm. they make um, all of the, first of all, they started 1% of, for the planet, which is a uh, a nonprofit um, foundation designed to contribute one percent of your profit um, towards uh, sustainability and conservation. The nonprofit is dedicated to improving um, the lives of human beings on this planet and environment and um, conservation efforts. So, Patagonia and Avon Chouinard, which is the founder of Patagonia, started that movement, and now there are um, hundreds of thousands of um, companies across the country that contribute to uh, that foundation, that 1% of it for the planet. Um, so I, I base my um, method and my practice and my philosophy on Patagonia's commitment to everything that they manufacture was done in a conscious way to minimize their, the harm that they do. So they, they use um, a lot of recycled plastic bottles, for example, in the, the fleece jackets that they make. They use exclusively organic cotton and uh, organic hemp um, in the manufacturing of their, of their, their products. So they're, they're very responsible in what they manufacture, how they manufacture it. They make things designed to last for decades. I've had the same Patagonia clothes for, for, for years and years and years, and they're just designed to, to last a long, long time. Um, unlike a lot of products that are manufactured to break so that you have to upgrade to the next one. A lot of electronic, um, and it's, it's been proven that this is true, a lot of the manufa elect electronics manufacturing industry, they make things intentionally designed to not last a long time so that people will have to upgrade um, over and over and over again, um, un unnecessarily, needlessly. So when conscious consumer is really about deciding that you're going to make a commitment to buying things that are durable 
and will last a long, long time, and um, were, were manufactured in a way that didn't, that intentionally did not do harm to the people or the environments that they were manufactured in. So that's that's conscious consumerism in a nutshell. Wow. And being a conscious consumer is really, really important, not only for your own pocketbook, but also for the environment and every person that's involved in the creation of whatever item you particularly have. That's that's really mind bowling. And it's, I, it's such a it's important to note that it's such um, an anomaly. Unfortunately, there are not there there is no um, mandate for manufacturers and companies and corporations to do things responsibly. Um, th there is no requirement that they do things responsibly. So most of the things that are bought are, are manufactured and made in a way that is not responsible. There is not that level of intentional mindfulness and purposefulness that goes into the manufacturing process. Most companies and corporations manufacture goods um, solely with the profit in mind. So how can we make this the, the least expensively and turn as big of a profit no matter what the, the human or environmental impact costs are? So th that's why this is so important. It, this book is called Clutter Free Revolution because it really is trying to inspire um, the next generation of conscious consumers so that they feel empowered to, to um, and obligated to be more mindful of the corporations that are pushing this stuff down our throats. So, you know, this whole Walmart mentality is how can we turn the biggest profit um, selling the, the, um, the, the worst crap on the planet manufactured in a way that is really not environmentally, environmentally sound um, at the expense of the people without giving them a living wage from concept to completion, cutting corners at every opportunity um, from toxic waste sites to, um, you know, chinting the, the, the individuals in, in the factories where these things are, are manufactured, all the way to paying the people in stores a living wage. Um, a lot, most corporations on this planet do not do a good job of this. So that's why it's important and it's up to the consumer to demand a, a better level of consciousness. Um, that, and, I, and, and Rosa Parks taught us this. If the, the service providers are not giving us what we want, we will boycott these industries until they give us, the, until they do the right thing. That's the only way we will affect change on this planet, is if, we, if, is if we demand better from the people that are trying to sell us this garbage. Um, so that's where this conscious consumer, the mentality, has the opportunity to shift an entire, an entire movement of consumerism on this planet. Wow, Evan, that is so incredible and it really makes you think about it. Um, I would like to uh, get more involved in this, this revolution that you're creating after the commercial breaks. But before we take commercial breaks, you mentioned earlier that you have your professional practice website, which was myintentionalsolutions.com. And that's... Yeah. And you also have your book website, which is clutterfreerevolution.com. Yes. Fabulous. We're going to take a short commercial break, and we'll be right back. Be you to the fullest. That's beautiful. And it is the secret to living your life on purpose. But so many people suffer not knowing who they are and what they are here for because of the ongoing influences shooting all over us. Are you ready to break free, take back your power, and discover exactly what makes you, you? Your own university is the number one online self-awareness community, here to help you confidently know yourself and step into your ideal life. Our directory is full of highly qualified personal coaches, 
that have helped over 100,000 women from all over the world transform their lives inside and out. Come fall in love with yourself and discover true fulfillment at yourownuniversity.com. The It's Your Turn Radio Show with Denise Dominguez is on every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Join Denise Dominguez, an empowerment and relationship coach, as she invites experts on for interviews and how they help women with their knowledge and expertise to break through that stuck space you're in. You'll learn tools and techniques to move forward in life with confidence and clarity that Denise will share with you. Listen every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern by going to blogtalkradio.com slash yourownuniversityradio.com. The It's Your Turn Radio Show with Denise Dominguez. From the best-selling author of From Bondage to Happiness, Antika Lisha will personally walk you through her new program featuring her radical forgiveness, Freedom Formula. This is for you if you are ready to once and for all be released from the chains of past abuse and take your power back. Radical Forgiveness is a five-week step-by-step system to release the chains of a traumatic past trapping in fear, reactivity, and stress, and gently free you, allowing you to take your power back and claim your beautiful life. Get instant access to your first video and a free 60-minute discovery session with Antica herself, a $250 value at AnticaLibby.com slash Radical Forgiveness. The Wealthy Wednesday radio show is on every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Join me, Lucy McMonagle, an Abundance Breakthrough Coach, author, and public speaker as your host as I interview expert guests that will inspire and empower you. Listen every Wednesday or catch the archived shows by going to blog talk radio forward slash ambitious women unite radio. That's blog talk radio.com forward slash ambitious women unite radio join me your host lucy mcmonagle for the wealthy wednesday radio show every wednesday welcome back to the wealthy wednesday radio show this is your host lucy mcmonagle and i am so grateful you're with us today we have an incredible guest his name is evans and he Evan, and he wrote The Clutter-Free Revolution, Simplify Your Stuff, Organize Your Life, and Save the World. You can go to his website at clutterfreerevolution.com, and we were talking earlier in regards to conscious consumerism, and in your book, Evan, you write, this book is not about organizing your closets. It's a call to arms, a rally cry to take a stand in the revolution against corporatocracy and commercial imperialism, to champion a new standard of common sense sustainability. And then you also go on to say this book is about reprioritizing, redirecting scarce resources, developing a more sustainable paradigm of market accountability and consumer responsibility, paring down our stuff and becoming mindful about our spaces is not just a pleasant alternative to living in disarray, it is a moral imperative as members of the human race. Now this is kind of starting to sound like a revolution that you're calling and can you explain the connection between becoming clutter free and standing up for what you call commercial imperialism? Sure, so this is um, a a lot along the lines of what we've been talking about. Um, I'm afraid that what's happening in this country is that um, there's there's so many, there's so, sorry, there's so few people with so much money that are pulling the strings and our government, um, our, our local governments, not as much as our, our federal government and our state government, have really been tremendously influenced by a handful of corporations, um, powerful special, special interest groups that are really pulling the strings financially of what they want politicians in this country 
to be promoting, and it's usually to benefit corporations, um, not benefit the people of this country and what is sustainable for um, middle class and low income families. It's what they're doing is really designed to um, embolden and empower the interests of a very small handful of very, very affluent people. Um, and we're seeing that uh, in, in every strata um, of this country um, and across the board. So w what I'm trying to do is like I said before the break was, really empowering people to do something about that by boycotting industries that, that are harmful and really supporting industries that are um, really designed with sustainability in mind. For example, um, local uh, CSAs, which is Community Service Agriculture, really supporting local food production, supporting local secondhand stores, thrift stores and consigners, um, what that does is it takes manufacturing out of circulation and what it does is it empowers on a grassroots level people to affect positive change in their local communities by closing the gate on these less desirable companies and, and manufactured products and opening the door um, towards uh, um, opportunities for local um, economies to build and support themselves from within. So it's really taking this, this global consumer base and refocusing it to their hyperly local, hyper local economy. So that means tearing out your grass and, and, and starting a garden. And if you can't do that, supporting your local community garden. And if you can't do that, supporting your local farm production, um, trying to buy as local as locally as you're able to, um, and, and really taking back um, our ability to be resourceful and self-reliant and um, working together in small communities to meet our needs um, rather than just spending all our time and all of our resources spending money on things that continue to perpetuate the problem. Wow. Well, that, that makes a perfect sense, Evan. And a lot of times when when we perpetuate the problem, a lot of people feel, well, if I only had this or if I only had that, and continuing to purchase more and more stuff can, can be detrimental to not only ourselves but into the environment also and all of the people that are affected by the manufacturing process of creating that item. True. <laughs> That's true. Absolutely. So now in your book you introduce a fictitious character whose name is Hope. Can you tell us a little bit about Hope and her role in the book? Yeah, so I wanted this book to be um, a pretty personal expression um, from me and my heart to my reader um, and I, I wanted to be able to convey the relationship that takes place um, in the same kind of a way that, that I develop relationships with the, the clients that I work with in their homes. I wanted to make this book feel personal so that you could really get a sense of um, what kinds of dynamics go into the trust that has to happen in order to help people through a lot of these, these, uh, you know, their clutter and so forth. So Hope was was a, is a fictitious character, and she's basically a combination of all of my um, of all of my clients. Um, she she's a mom. Um, she's trying to get back to work. Um, she's got three kids. Um, she's put her her career on hold until you know her youngest is able to get back to um, to. It, 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 to start elementary school, essentially. Um, and she's excited about getting back to work. She's excited about cleaning up her house. She's excited about um, putting herself first for the first time in a, a decade or more because she's just been a busy mom. Um, and this is an, a way for me to tell her story and for the reader to experience her success 
in a very personal way. She talks about her, her aging parents. Um, she talks about her friends and neighbors who are also trying to deal with their own challenges around these issues. So it's just a way for me to convey lots of different kinds of ideas um, through the course of this, this um, character development. So you, by the end of the book, you really know Hope pretty well. And most people can identify with her um, right away. And, they, and, and when they see her process, because I, I am continuously going back and forth with her, we, we, the book is based on this correspondence between Hope and I. Um, where she'll, she'll send me a, a message and then I'll reply to the message and then go into depth about um, how, to, how to proceed and resolve that problem or that challenge. So it really is a way for, you, for the reader of this book to experience not only her pain and her challenge, but how she overcomes those challenges and comes out on top at the end and feels, and it, it's life-changing. It is absolutely life-changing. And I thought that by, by creating this character, the reader could really feel that life change, and they could really feel empowered to start this process. Wow, that is very ingenious, absolutely ingenious. And utilizing, you know, the the confidentiality of your 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 private practice, and creating a, a fictitious character where you can still allow. The, the questions, the concerns, the, the hardships and the challenges and the triumphs and the successes of, of all of your clients into one character because she it, she is the epitome of, of what you've been working with and how you've really helped people become successful and how to help them declutter their life so that they have more money, more health, more finances and more more precious time with their family is incredibly ingenious. That's excellent. Um, I have a couple of more questions. We have a little bit more time. Now, your professional background is as a, a middle school, high school, a middle school history teacher. And how did you get into per, the professional organizing and how did you come up with your methods? So, great question. So, um, my background is, is as a teacher, as you said, and um, so my, I have a master's degree in experiential education and curriculum de development. And what that means is I know how to um, figure out how to take a certain um, principle, uh, ideas, framework, if you will, um, for how to do something specific and turn it into a process that I'm able to teach in a way that you're going to be able to learn it kinesthetically and just do it right out of the box. So I can, I can by taking my background um, in, in education, I've learned how to take the conceptually how to clean up your house into and trans, uh, uh, transpose it or um, uh, create it into a simple method if you follow, it's basically a workflow or a flow chart. It's basically follow these steps. Um, step one, do this, then do this, then do this. And if you get stuck, go back to step one and start the process all over again. And um, it, this book is all about repeating those three steps over and over and over again. So um, my background um, is, is really about, um, uh, well, I was, I was a teacher and then I worked in the nonprofit sector for, for uh, about 12 years in the program uh, departments and organizational leadership. Um, and then uh, I had an opportunity to, to just organize these, or these businesses and these organizations as a staff member. And then finally I decided, gosh, if I can clean this up, I can do anything. Um, so I decided to go into business for myself and I, I figured organization was the thing that I was really best at. Um, and it resonated for people, and I had kind of been helping my friends and family to get organized for years, and so it was a pretty natural fit. Uh, and all I had to do was come up with um, a lesson plan, if you will, or a strategy or a process um, that I could use over and over and over again for all of my clients. And so far, that one method applies to absolutely everybody right out of the box. Wow. 
And that's that's one of the nice things about how your book is separate and how your methods is separate from other people is because you do have that educational experience of being a teacher and helping other people create a lesson plan which is a step-by-step system and it's you know you have step one you have step two step step three and you know if you need to start over you just start from step one again and a lot of times that really helps people to become more organized and not just the decluttering of the house, but organized in their thinking, organized in the way that they interact with other people, and organized in their finances. That's absolutely brilliant. I love that concept. I um, you, Your professional practice is based out of Aspen, Colorado. And Aspen, Colorado is known by many people as one of the places for the rich and for the famous. And how, what have you seen in the course of your work, and how does that compare to households, other households in, around the country? So what I've learned, um, I, I'm based here, but you don't have to go very far from Aspen to see um, low-income families who really struggle. Um, I, I don't know what the, um, the statistic is in the state of Colorado for uh, people who live on the edge of poverty, but there are a number of communities not very far from Aspen that, that have um, a, a, lot of, a lot of poverty. Um, so what I have found in, in regionally uh, and within 40 miles of Aspen certainly, that there is while there's a big discrepancy in socioeconomic status, the issues that we're talking about, clutter, disorganization, um, chronic consumption, where people just amass a lot of stuff, they just buy and buy and buy and buy and shop and shop and shop. Those things are not different. And quite frankly, the things that people buy, whether you're on the you know, on one end of the socioeconomic spectrum or the other, or right in the middle. The things that we buy, it's all the same stuff. Some of those things are name brands. Some of those things are generic brands. Some of those things are um, brand new, fresh out of the package. And some of those things are, are old and torn and ratty. But it's all the same stuff. It's all the same stuff. And people amass things, whether they're very, very expensive things or um, really, really super budget things, they, they collect those things for the same reason. And so in my work with people, it's really about helping people overcome those challenges. Um, it doesn't matter if you live in a 10,000 square foot home in Aspen or a double wide or a single wide trailer in a trailer park um, on the opposite end of the valley. The issues there are the same. People need to get rid of stuff that doesn't serve them. It's not serving who they are and what they want to, you know, who they want to be and what they want to do. They need to organize the things that are essential to their lives, and they need to um, get and stay inspired to change their lifestyle in such a way so that it's that they're they're living the life that they want to live. Um, so it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is. Everybody's got the same stuff. It's all the same. Just like alcoholism and substance abuse is the same no matter where you are on the socioeconomic divide. Domestic violence is the same no matter where you are on the, on the socioeconomic divide. Um, you know, poverty is a unique challenge, but affluence and sometimes really grotesque affluence has its own challenges as well. Um, I'll tell you this, money doesn't buy happiness. And I've seen that in household after household after household, serving the you know the, some of the most affluent people in Aspen. Um, sometimes um, people just want to simplify their lifestyle. They just want to make things simpler, and and they and they're making that connection that there's a there's a, a um, the stuff that they have is not making them happy, and if they had less. And if they could get organized and if they could connect with the people in their lives, they might be a little bit happier. And that's what I help people do, no matter, no, no matter what their bank account looks like. 
Wow, and connecting with the, the people in your life is one of the most precious things that we can possibly do. And, you know, honestly, a lot of people, when they're always running around um, earning the, the dollars so that they can buy the stuff, it keeps them in a loop where they're, they're like on a little uh, mouse wheel, if you would say, because they're running to get the money to buy the stuff to sort of feel happy for a few moments and then they have to go and get the money to pay off the debt because of the stuff <laughs> so when when you stop that 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 cycle you actually bring it back to where we are currently and that's to be with people who who we really cherish who we love who we adore and to be with our family and our friends and and other professionals that are supporting our movement now, we only have like about five more minutes for the show, and I wanted to end with a quick question. In the back of your book, you allude to the Clutter-Free Revolution Academy. Could you give us a little bit more information about the Clutter-Free Academy? Yeah, so Clutter-Free Revolution Academy is designed as a companion to the book. Um, and basically what it is, it's a, it's a 90-day crash course. This is boot camp for your house. Um, it's a, it's a, um, a deep dive immersion into uh, the, the concepts of the book. How do you um, get an ideal vision for your spaces? How can you simplify? How can you get organized? How can you refresh your spaces? So this is for people who loved the book and they, they need a little bit more help doing it in their own homes. Now, I can't go to all of these places around the country and work one-on-one -on -one with people. It would be too expensive for people. So what I've done is I've created a program where it's a, it's a, I get a class, it's a cohort of, of students from around the country, and they call in four times a week. We're going to have um, work sessions. You can listen to as many or as few as you want because they're all recorded and you can listen to them in your own time. Um, so. There's a, a private forum on Facebook, so all you really need is uh, an internet connection, a Facebook account, and a cell phone. And if you've got those three things, then you can participate in this program. And what it is is a, there's a, a comprehensive curriculum guide, and what we do is I take you through every room of your house. We talk about um, communication. Um, we talk about getting household buy-in with all of the members of your household. We talk about the unique challenges of having infants, toddlers, teenagers, preteens. Um, how do you get buy-in from your spouse? How do you deal with um, aging parents and dementia and end of life? And what happens after someone passes? What do you, how do you deal with the stuff left over? Um, we talk about the difference between functional storage and archival storage and how to make all of the spaces of your home work for you and your family. And I walk you through it. It's over 90 days of programming, um, and it's um, it's a three-month semester. And I take you soup to nuts, concept to completion. Um, it's it, it, there's nothing like this on the market. There's no other program this comprehensive um, that that I have seen anywhere. Um, and it's based on um, I've been beta testing this program all summer with with families across the country, and people love it. Not only that, they're shocked that they can get these kinds of results with a program that's telephone-based. Most people say, how are you going to help me with my space over the phone? And really all it does is it breaks down the framework. It tells you that it can walk through the steps in every room of your house, and I tell you exactly what to do with every little thing. And um, if you can block the time and you get an assignment, you get a new module where we, where we um, introduce a new topic, and I give you lots of explanation and instruction, and I give you I give you a little pep talk, and I'll, I, I get you hyped up to do it. I give you an assignment, and then I give you five days to work on that assignment, and then we come back and we do a QA, and a um, and we just talk about that assignment and what worked for you and what didn't work for you. And because it's a group call, you get the input from everyone else in your class. So you, it's, it, we're creating a community of people that are all in this together, and we share before and after pictures on Facebook, and we're posting inspiring pictures of kitchens and bedrooms and um, you know, all different kinds of um, systems to organize your garage and your basement. 
Um, so it's really it's a it's a great way to feel like you're a part of a community that's all working on this for the, at the same time for the same reason. So um, so I offer the, the the academy three times a year, um, and it um, it's a great way to get a little bit more help or a lot more help actually. Um, if you've read the book and you, and now you just need a little bit more help going through the steps. Wow, wow, that's incredible because a lot of people, they'll read a book and they want more. They want to go dive deeper, but they're not able to because there is not a program. And your, your clutterfreerevolution.com and your Clutter Free Revolution book is really going to help people to dive deep to help become more healthy, wealthy, and happier by becoming more clutter free. Now, your website is clutterfreerevolution.com and is that where they would go to find out about the academy? Clutterfreerevolution.com is everything about the CFR brand. So um, the ebook will be there, the book is there, the academy is there. Um, there's a link to my, if you go there, there's also a link to my professional practice website which talks about um, the other things that I do. Um, and and that, that link will take you to uh, myintentionalsolutions.com. You can also find me on Facebook, um, at Clutter Free Revolution uh, on Facebook. Um, and I'm Clutter Free Revolution on Amazon. So if you just search Clutter Free Revolution on, on Google, um, I'll come up. So there's lots of different ways to find me. Fabulous, fabulous. I am so grateful that you have been on the Wealthy Wednesday radio show. I'd like to thank you personally and kindly for helping us understand how to become clutter-free and how to st set a revolution so that we can be more wealthier. Well, thanks, Lucy, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, until next time. Thanks for listening to the Wealthy Wednesday Radio Show with Lucy McMonagle. That's on every Wednesday. Join us next time for more inspiration and empowerment from various topics and expert guests. To personally contact Lucy McMonagle, visit L-U-C-I-M-C-M-O-N-A-G-L-E dot com. That's LucyMcMonagle.com. Until next time, many blessings. <laughs>